So hopefully what you've done is you're already familiar with what negligence is as a concept and you've also had a look at the video about duty of care. If you haven't seen that video you need to pause this one and you need to go back and watch it and get your head around that because this is a flow of things so you've got to understand and know the first part before you can move on to the second part. So assuming that And remember that in order to prove negligence, there are three parts that you've got to prove and they've got to be proven in this order. Now, whatever you do, read the exam question carefully because it may ask you to focus on a particular element. So whatever you do, focus on the element that it asks you to look at because you will get no marks for focusing on something that it doesn't want. So in the previous video, we looked at duty of care. And I'm assuming that in your answer, if it just asks you discuss whether so-and-so is negligent in their dealings with thingamabob, that you will have already looked at duty of care. And this video will move on and look at breach of that duty of care. So if you're not given any steer, then you must go through each part in turn. And you can't bob around and do one bit from here and one bit from elsewhere. That's why. So hopefully, hopefully, you should have on your piece of paper something that looks something like this, uh, which is about the concept of duty of care. Now, if this was a lesson, I would go through this with you again, make sure that you were super, super comfortable with that. But you don't want me prattling on about the same thing again. So we will move on from there. So let's have a look at breach of duty, which is the next principle on from duty of care. And just like before, I'd like you to pause the video here and I would like you to take down your own copy of these notes on a piece of A4 paper. Just like before, make sure you lay them out, make sure you space them out so that you've got some room around each point to add extra notes. And I'm also going to ask that you rewrite these in sort of neat form once the video is over so that you've got an A4 page which is your best copy. So pause the video here and take this down please. So the first case that we need to have a look at to establish a breach of duty of care, we are looking at the standard which is applied. And the first standard that we look at comes from a case called Blythe and Birmingham Waterworks and it's the reasonable man test. This is an objective test so you are looking at what would the reasonable average person think or feel or see or realise in this situation and at the time of the case it was described as the man on the Clapham omnibus and I've included a picture below so that you've got some idea what an omnibus was. So if the defendant falls below the standard of the reasonable man then they may have breached their duty of care and what we're asked to say is what would the reasonable person have foreseen in those particular circumstances? But they are the reasonable person, the average person. They're not expected to display any level of perfection, any great insight, any particular intelligence. They are the average person sitting on the bus next to you. And if you're given a scenario question, when you are looking at the particular scenario, all you need to be doing is say, well, what would I have seen in that circuit? Would I have realised that that was a bad idea? And with the kind of scenarios that you're going to be given, it's going to be fairly obvious whether it was sensible or not. So Blythe and Birmingham Waterworks gives us the average person doing a normal thing. But there are also two other standards that we need to have a look at. And this one is going to be particularly relevant to you if you're learning to drive. So it's a case called Nettleship and Western, which was about a learner driver. And in this case, the learner driver crashed into a lamppost on their first driving lesson, injuring their instructor. 
Now, people always say to me, but the instructor quite often has brakes. They have their own steering wheel, blah, blah, blah. Um, this was just a friend had said, let me take you out and learn to drive. They've regretted it ever since. And the instructor successfully sued the learner driver for breach of duty of care causing damage, so for their negligence. And what the court says is learner drivers are expected to drive at the same standard as experienced and competent drivers. And we're given this really nifty quote that you've got to include in your answers. Standards may rise, but they may not fall. Now, on the face of it, putting yourself in the position of the learner driver, you inevitably think, well, that's not fair. Why, why are they expected to drive like a qualified driver if they are not, in fact, a qualified driver? And yeah, I can see that from their perspective. But think about the injured person. Is it going to make any difference to the injured person whether they are mown over or crashed into by a qualified driver or a learner driver? No, it will make no difference to them whatsoever. And a driver will be insured, so their insurance company will pay out. It's not like the individual themselves will be paying for it. So yes, I can see why you might think it's a little bit unfair, but we're thinking about the claimant when we're making these rules. So that's the situation with learners, whether you think they're fair or not. And finally, we have to have a look at professionals in the case of Bolam and Frian Hospital. So this is an old case, so please don't think that this is bang up to date medical knowledge because it's not. Um, a claimant was a mentally disordered patient, so somebody with mental health problems, and they were being given electric shock therapy. As part of the electric shock therapy, the doctor at the time took the decision not to strap the patient down and the patient fell off the bed and was injured as a result. And the court said that we had to look, when we're looking at professionals, they are expected to be of the standard of the ordinary and skilled man exercising that special skill. So in that case, a qualified doctor. But for professionals, you would be looking at anybody who was professionally qualified using those skills. So it might be doctors, accountants, it might be a tree surgeon, any of those people who've got special skills. So first of all, we have to establish the standard which is expected. If it's a learner, then you're going to go with the learner standard. If they're a professional, if they are doing their job at the time, then you're going to go with professionals. If they are doing anything else, then you're going to look at the reasonable man test and apply it appropriately. Once you've done that and we've worked out what standard they are expected to achieve, we have to have a look at what is known as the risk factors to establish whether the duty of care has actually been breached. So what we do with the standard is work out how good they need to be and then we look at the risk factors to work out whether that standard has not in fact been reached. And the risk factors that we're going to have a look at are the following. You've got the magnitude of the risk, the potential of serious harm, practicality of taking precautions, the benefit of doing the ac activity outweighing the risk of not doing it. And we're going to have a look at a case which illustrates each one. So starting off with the magnitude of the risk, we have the case of Bolton and Stone. In this case, a woman was hit by a cricket ball, which was hit out of the cricket ground over a 17 foot high fence, which had only been cleared, supposedly, five or six times in the past 30 years. The court held that the risk of injury was so small that the defendant was not negligent in continuing to play cricket without the extra precautions it was not unreasonable for them not to erect an even higher fence. Five or six times, people aren't even sure how many, in 30 years was such a small risk that the defendant didn't have to self safeguard against it. So we have a look at the potential of serious injury. And this is a case called Paris and Stepney Borough Council. 
In this case, our claimant had only one eye. And he was injured and blinded in the other eye whilst at work when he was splashed with acid as part of his job. His employer knew that he only had one working eye and knew that he was vulnerable and therefore they were under a strict duty to look after him because the potential for serious harm was increased for that particular individual. And it hadn't been re a reasonable employer in allowing him to be injured so they were in breach of duty. So the potential of serious injury for this person who only had one working eye at the start of it was much higher than the average person who had two working eyes because the injury would render them completely blind. So moving on, we have to look at the practicality of taking precautions. And this can be seen in the case of Latimer and AEC Limited. So there was a sudden rainstorm which flooded a factory. The floor was very slippery, so the factory owners did everything they reasonably could. They put down sawdust to try and mop up the excess water, but it wasn't enough due to the extreme flood. The claimant slipped and was injured and took the defendant to court. And the court held that the defendant had done every reasonably practical precaution to reduce the danger. They, you, you're not expected to take every single possible precaution because the only way that you can prevent anybody from being injured in your place of work is to not allow anybody into your place of work and that's not practical is it it's not possible so there is always going to be a level of risk and as long as you have taken all the practical sensible precautions then you're not going to have breached your duty and finally, we have the case of Watt and Herefordshire County Council, where we're looking at the risk factor, does the benefit outweigh the risk of the activity? So in this particular case, a firefighter was injured by lifting gear because it was on an inadequate fire engine. So the vehicle which was being used to transport this particular piece of equipment wasn't sufficient to carry it. And the court said, we have to balance the risk to the firefighter against the measure. And in this case, the benefit to the person being rescued outweighed the risk to the firefighter. And therefore, the defendant was not in breach of duty. So hopefully, you should have something that looks a bit like this now. At the top, you're looking at what standard is your defendant expected to live up to? So are they... A normal average person going about their everyday lives so you're looking at the reasonable man test are they a learner or are they a professional and then we have a look at each one of the risk factors and you need to apply each one of these and look at how likely is the harm have all practical precautions been taken how serious could the harm have been and is the defendant's risky activity socially important once you've done that you will have established whether there has been a breach of duty. So I hope that was nice and clear. Um, what I'd like you to do next is take the notes that you've written and write those up into a, a more organised format. If you want to leave them in the structure that I've done them in, that's absolutely fine. If you want to write them in a different way, that's no problem either. And the next video that we will be looking at is breach of duty causing damage. Thanks for listening.